God bless you. Mm-hmm. Another beautiful, beautiful, beautiful day. Um, all right. There's, there's something that's just resonating. I think I just wanted us to, uh, we've talked about it in morning prayers. Sometimes we forget why we're doing what we're doing. So let's, let's just remind ourselves. Let's go to John 20, 30. I think Tunji brought our attention to this scripture and then it came up again in another uh, study. John 20, 30 and 31. It says, and many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Okay. Um, I, I, love, I love how he doesn't say much more than that, that you may have life. When you have life, uh, you live. <laughs> life is for the living. So when you live, you affect, you, 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 tr- you transform lives. That's what Jesus did. Jesus, uh, he lived uh, and he, he, he made a difference in, in the way that people, are. Uh, let, let's see if we can. Let's also go to 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 11, now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Okay, so that that again is is very, very important. These things are written so that we can be transformed. All right, today I want us to, we're going to look at something quite interesting it it might be in two parts so we'll we'll do to this this one and then our last one um i want us to look at um wholeness i want us to look at wholeness from god's perspective uh, uh so there are two dimensions to what we're going to look at uh, so the the um it, it, it's going to be titled Bethesda House of Mercy. Then uh, the subheading is The Quest for Wholeness. Bethesda House of Mercy. The Quest for Wholeness. All right, let's go to our text for today. So remember, these things are written so that we can, you know, be transformed. So I want you to really, really pay attention to some of the things that you are hearing uh, and see how it works. Let's go to John chapter 5, verses 1 to 18. John 5, 1 to 18. From the KJV. All right. If we're there, John 5, 1 to 18. I read. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market. Now, I want you to note that market there is in italics, uh, which means it was added by the translators to to help your understanding. So now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In there lay a great multitude of impotent folk. I want you to please make note. I want you to be attentive this morning. There are details that, or, or every detail is very important. And please don't say, oh, I've heard this message before. Oh, uh, you know, we, we talked about this the other day. Now, why are we, you know, no, no, no. Just listen with fresh ears because there are details that you have missed before and which are going to be very, very important for what we're saying. So in there, in this um, pool with, with, with five porches, in there lay a great multitude of important folk, 
of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, now in that case is in italics, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The quest for wholeness. Okay. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another step it down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed. And walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? And he that was will, healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Mm. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. He had made somebody whole on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them. Jesus answered them. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's 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 take time and let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's all pray. The Bible says that these things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. These things are written so that we might order our lives based on what we are hearing. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you because your word is truth. It's life. It's health to our flesh. It's strength. It's wisdom. It's counsel. Therefore, we order our steps. We cleanse our ways. We, we get direction for our paths by your word. Thank you for the fact that the word is not hidden. It is open for all to, to see and all to understand and hear. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you praise. Help us to grasp what you're trying to teach us today. Uh, because there is a purpose, a time and a season for everything, and a purpose uh, that you want to fulfill in these times. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's, let's, let's start with this thought. Jesus had this habit sometimes of asking questions that seemed to be, they, they, 
if you were the one at the receiving end and you had no understanding, you would think those questions were crude or rude or that they were, you know, actually sometimes irreverent or irrelevant uh, or sometimes rhetorical. That means they didn't even need an answer. How would you ask somebody certain questions? So, for example, let, let, let's look at some of the questions that Jesus asked. I'm, I'm doing this purposely because I want you from now on, every time you hear a question in the scriptures, every time you hear God ask somebody a question, you need to put yourself in that situation. Ask yourself, what is, this, what is he asking me? What is he saying to me? Um, he, Jesus asked blind Bartimaeus. He says, what wilt thou that I should do unto you? Hmm. You see, many times we find ourselves in the place of prayer or in the place of a problem or just doing life and we are, either have challenges that are beyond our capacity or people around us have challenges and then we start to pray and the first thing that God asks you is, what wilt thou that I should do unto you? What do you want? Now, that is not, it's not actually a crude question. It's not rude. It's not, it's not irre irrelevant or irreverent. It's not even rhetorical. Because when you come to an interview, it's, it's very interesting. You come to an interview for a job. They know the job. They know what the job specifications are. They know, they, they, they put out the advert. You answered the advert. Then you are at the interview. Then they ask you, what are you here for? What do you want? What, are you, what do you expect? Now, that sounds like a crazy issue. Are, are you not the ones who put out the, the, the uh, job interview? Why are you asking me? That's, that, you should, if, you, if you are bold, you should say, why are you asking me? After all, you are the ones who put out. You know what you want, so that, that's why I'm here. No, you don't. You, <laughs> you, <laughs> you start to explain to them that, yes, I am, I am I'm a qualified this and that. You are a company that does this and that. You, you, you want to achieve this and that. And I want to be a part of what you're doing. And you want to be a part of what I have. So it's not, it's, not, it's not as crazy as it sounds. What do you want me to do unto you? So the obvious questions, the, the, the silly questions, the questions that look like they don't have an answer. Now, he asked the woman with the issue of blood. You know, when, when, when people were around him, when the woman, with he asked, when that woman, he said, who touched my clothes? Now, when he asked that question, the disciples thought that he was just being facetious or just what, what? You know, and you can trust Peter. Peter took him up on it. Peter said, what are you, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean who, who touched you? What, what does that even mean with all these people around you? When the multitudes gathered and were hungry, Jesus asked the question, how many loaves have ye? Now, when he asked that question, the people said, look, even if, when you're talking about loaves, even if we are, were to go and buy 200 penny worth, it would not be enough for everybody to take a piece, let alone how do we feed these people. So, uh, so when you come at those questions from a rational perspective, they look as if they are extraneous. They are, they are not relevant to the, they are immaterial, they are impertinent, they are un, unapplicable, they are inappropriate. That's, that's how they appear to you. But Jesus always had a reason for doing what he was doing. He always, when he asked a question, it, it, it wasn't just a random question. It wasn't just, he didn't know what to do. I wasn't thinking. He just thought, mm, let me just, or let me start a conversation. Let's go to verse 19 of John 5, verse 19. Jesus explained his actions to the people when they were making a fuss and everything. Why are you healing him on the Sabbath day? Blah, blah, blah. You know, they were making a fuss, you know, and Jesus answered them, you know. Jesus answered he answered so they asked the question just like he asks you a question and expects you to answer when you ask him a question he will answer he will answer that's the beautiful thing about jesus he will always answer the question so jesus answered and said unto them verily verily i say unto you now 
I love it when Jesus uses verily, verily, because that's the truth you can't live without. He's saying, most assuredly, I'm just, I'm telling you truly, truly. And then he's, he's saying, I say unto you, now, remember him saying, you have read in the old covenant, but I say. So when Jesus says, I say unto you, what he's doing is, he's saying as the word, the living word that became flesh, when I say unto you, I am putting things in perspective. I am helping you to understand something that mankind may never have understood. And I'm giving you insight. I say unto you, who am I? Remember we asked last week, who are you? <laughs> who am I? Mm, the Christ, the Messiah, the son. I am the son of the living God. So I can say unto you, when I say unto you, I know what I'm saying. I know why I'm saying what I'm saying. I have all the information that mankind has never had. I, I hope somebody's getting something this morning. It's already, it's already exciting. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, that's what things soever the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. In other words, they were asking, why are you taking up your bed and walking on the Sabbath day? And Jesus was telling them that, the reason I healed this man on the Sabbath day is because I saw my father working on the Sabbath, doing this work on the Sabbath. So and I can do nothing of myself. I only do what I see the father do. And whatsoever things I see my father do, that's what I do. So the reason that this man, I, I, I healed this man on the Sabbath is because that is what I saw my father do. Hallelujah. Ah, now let's go to another question. Let's go to another question that Jesus asked. Do you recall that after the fall, what was the question that God asked Adam? What was the question that God asked Adam? Does anybody remember? Help me, somebody. Where are you? Where are you? Where art thou? Where art thou? Where are you? Okay. Incidentally, I, I think... Uh, that's the first question in the old in the old covenant. I think it's the first question that is asked in the old covenant uh, uh, of, 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 of Adam, you know, when he he has he has he has fallen. Where are you? Hmm? After the fall, that's the first question. Where are you? Where are you? Now, that sounds like a crazy question because God is talking to him in the garden. He's there. He's standing in front of God in the garden of Eden, having fallen. And God is asking him, where are you? What, how does that make sense? You see how sometimes those questions, if you come at it from a mental or if, you know, a, a human perspective, it doesn't make sense. But God wasn't asking him where he was physically. That was not the question. The question is, spiritually, where are you? Where are you? Where, what, what is your relationship with God now? Where are you? Okay. Do you remember God also asking Cain after he had killed his brother Abel? Where is Abel your brother? Now, let, let, can I go back a little bit? Can I go back? Uh, after the fall, the first question that God asked was, was what? Where are you? Okay. Does anybody know what the first question in the New Testament is in Matthew? First question. Does anybody have an idea what the first question in the New Testament is in the book of Matthew? Where is how anybody? can these things be? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. No, but just um is it Pastor, is it where is he who is he, who is being born king of the Jews? That's it. That's that's the question. That's the question. So it's very interesting. Uh after the fall, the first question that God asks 
Adam is, where are you? So he asked the first Adam, where are you? And then in the new covenant, after the birth of Christ, he asked, the first question he asked is, where is he? Where is Jesus? Okay. So it's important, not so, it's not as important where I am as where he is. Because where he is will determine where I am. Uh, that's, that's another day's message. Uh, after Cain killed his brother, God asked, where is Abel thy brother? Now, we know that God is aware of where he was. Why is God asking that question? He's asking the question because he's he was trying to get Cain to come to the place of repentance. He was trying to get Cain to acknowledge his fault, to, to realize, I have sinned, I've done the wrong thing, and then um, to see how they could take it from there. So now back to our text. So in our text, Jesus asked a man who had been grievously sick, how long had this man been sick for? Can anybody tell me? How long had he been ill for? See, 38 years. That's it. Thank you, Jenna. 38 years. Now, we don't know whether he was 38, which means he was born with the infirmity, or whether he was 20 when he had the infirmity, which means he was now 58. We, don't, we really don't know. But what we do know is that he had been sick for 38 years. Okay? So there are some things that God doesn't give us the details about. And the things like, like we talked about over the last few days, the things he doesn't give us details about, we will not concern ourselves with them. But what, what he does tell us is that this man had been grievously sick for 38 years. Now, why would Jesus ask a person who has been sick for 38 years if he wanted to be made whole? Why on earth? Doesn't that sound like a, a rude question, a, a crude question, an irrelevant or irreverent? <laughs> Why? It sounds, it's, that's, that's how it sounds to a normal person, you know, who's operating in the flesh. But rather than see it as a crude or rude or irrelevant or irreverent, extraneous, immaterial, impertinent, inapplicable, inappropriate question, which are all the English words we like to use to, to abuse God when we are angry, you know, let us understand that what God was doing was asking a question of universal relevance. He was saying, everybody has to answer this question. Do you want to be made whole spiritually? That's why he was asking Adam, where are you? Where are you? And that's why the wise men were asking, where is he that was born? Because we want to, we saw his star in the east, we've come to worship him. We want to be made whole in the realm of worship, in the realm of apprehending. So when he asks you, will you be made whole? It's a universal, do you want to be made whole emotionally? I know you have been abused. I know things didn't go well. I know your parents divorced. I know there are all sorts of things that stood against your wholeness, that are fighting against your emotional wholeness. But God is asking the same question. Do you want to be made whole? And don't say, God, ah, you, don't you know what I've been through? Why, could, why do you want to ask me that question? No, 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 no. He knows what you've been through, but he wants to know what you, what you are ready to go to. He, he knows what you have been through, but he wants to know what you want to go to. Okay? It's also something you have to answer materially. Do you want to be made whole materially? Do you want to be made whole financially? Will that be made whole financially? Will that be made whole maritally? Will that be made whole educationally? Will that be made whole comprehensively? Wholeness means... Nothing is missing in your life. Nothing is broken. So he's asking the same question that he asked that man at the, at, at, at the pool. Do you want to be made whole? So it's, it's a question that you have to determine the answer to. But let's, let's follow the man and see how the man responds. So maybe that will affect or influence the way that we think about the question. 
Do you want to be made whole materially? Do you want to be made whole spiritually? Do you want to be made whole physically? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? Don't answer yet. Let's, let's follow. Because Jesus asked the question and then he did certain things. So let's see whether if we follow this journey, we might be able to get an answer. So let's go to our text, verse 2. Let's go to verse 2. It tells us about, um, you remember I told you that there was a word that was in italics there. It says, now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market. It's actually, you know, market days. So it, 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 it's, it's italicized. Uh, so it should really be by the sheep gate, okay? By the sheep gate. That's, that's really uh, what it should be. And what does it state? That, what is there? It says, by the sheep gate, a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda. Bethesda, having five porches. Now, Bethesda means a house. Beth is ha- house in, 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 in the Aramaic and the Hebrew. House of kindness or house of mercy or flowing water. So it's house of kindness or mercy or house of flowing water. Hmm? Now, I, I need you to really understand that all these things are not, you know, God is just such a beautiful God. Nothing is there by accident. Everything has a meaning. House of mercy. Hmm. Why would this place be called Bethesda, house of mercy, house of kindness, house of flowing water. Now, it's, it's, it's very pertinent. Now, let's go outside the scriptures for a moment and, and, and look at history. Uh, that, that, this was not the original name of, of the pool. Uh, Jewish history tells us that that pool, so this was an AKA, this was an Elias, you know, this name was actually given to that place by the Sikh folk who gathered there. Okay. So they were the ones who called it Bethesda, House of Mercy. Its original name was the Virgin's Well. The Virgin's Well. Now, you remember Madonna's song? Like a virgin. <laughs> you don't know Madonna, you're too holy. Thank God for your lives. <laughs> okay, now, why was it called the Virgin's Well? On this very spot, there used to be a spring. It was the cleanest and freshest water in all of Jerusalem because it was a spring from underground. It was an underground spring fresh on the ground. So it was it was clean and pure, like a virgin. That's why they call it the virgin's well, okay? Um, and then, so that's the first thing about it. It was a, 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 a well spring from on the ground. Then the second thing about it was, it was a hot spring. Whew, that's, that's really nice, uh, you, you know? And you know that people believe, it is generally believed that hot springs have, what? What do hot springs have? Most people say they have. Talk to me, people. Talk to me. Well, you, you are not going to just let me be talking, talking, talking. Healing properties. Healing. Yeah. It had therapeutic. Power. Yes, it had medicinal and therapeutic qualities. That's why people still go to hot waters. You know, Ikogo Sea Warm Spring. They go to Lords. They go to different places where there are warm springs because they believe that those things have healing. So, first of all, it was the cleanest, purest water coming from the earth. Then it was a hot spring. Then the third thing that was interesting about it was this. It was right next to the temple. Okay? So, now, I don't think that that was an accident. The fact that this purest and cleanest water coming from the earth was right next to the house of God, right next to the temple. I believe that in God's uh, economics, this hot spring and the temple were supposed to work together. They were, they, were, they were part of a, a, a glorious home. But guess what happened? Because this was right next to the temple, the priests, they, the priesthood, they annexed it. They annexed this pool and then they built a wall around it. Why? 
Anybody have an idea why they built a wall around it? To have sole use of it. That's it, to keep it exclusive. A big boys club for only the, only the elite, <laughs> the high priestly class, only those. So <laughs> to keep out all the rank and file, the hoi polloi, this is, this is for us. So they, they fenced it off and kept the general populace out. So, and then the fourth thing about it was it now, because they had done that, it became an exclusive club for the priesthood. So what did they do? They now began to develop the real estate around this pool. They dug and dug until they had a beautiful well developed into a diving swimming pool. In the Greek, it's called uh, Columbethra. So the, the people, people of God, this is very interesting. So there's a warm spring bringing up beautiful warm water. So they now dug around it, they fenced it off, dug around it, and then had a, 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 a swimming pool so that this hot water would flow into their swimming pool. Then they lined it, they lined its, its patios, they lined its pavements and walls with the most exquisite marble indeed it was so beautiful so this this natural phenomenon was now augmented by natural beauty by, by uh, uh, artificial beauty built around it marble walls marble patios marble pavements you know all uh, in this wonderful swimming pool so after service all the <laughs> the leaders the leadership Hallelujah. They would disrobe. After they had dismissed the people, they would disrobe and then they would swim in this <laughs> Columbethra. Now, but because the weather was so harsh, the sun was, 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 was so harsh and hot, they decided that they needed some kind of covered veranda. And they didn't want something that was temporary like canvas or something. So they needed to match the splendor of the pool that they had created. Are you here? So they therefore developed one of the most exquisite ornate porches. So this, this, this covered porch, you know, over the, the, the area of, of the pool. So uh, these were tiled, marbled, handcrafted. So this porch was tiled. It was marbled. It was handcrafted with the most exquisite paintings and artworks. So after swimming, hallelujah, they would go and sit in the porches and eat and drink and discuss weighty issues of state. Am I, am I painting a picture, church? It's very quiet this morning. It's yes, very... you are, sir. You're painting a vivid picture. <laughs> okay. Now, remember, remember this, that the priesthood were not just the religious leaders, but they were also the political leaders. And they were oftentimes also the financial magnates they were the they were the so they were the influential people so when we talk when when the bible says there was a ruler of the jews his name was nicodemus so nicodemus was one of, one of the members of the sanhedrin the political class he was also one of the uh, leaders of the church you know one of the religious leaders and then he was also one of the multi-millionaires so that's 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 what it was about when it talks about annas and caiaphas the high priests in those days they were they were political leaders they were not just religious leaders so um, now, so having built this porch, the, the sixth thing to notice is this, that the popularity of this thing grew and grew and everyone who was anyone wanted to be a part of this exclusive club, this good deal. And so soon, 
one porch was grossly inadequate. So what did they do? They built a second porch, exactly identical to the first one. And before long, they built a third porch. And before long, they built a fourth porch. And before long, they built what? A fifth porch. Okay. So now this little pool was completely surrounded by five ornate, perfectly identical porches with, you know, paintings and artworks and tiled marbles and all that and columns. Okay. Okay. Are you, are you, are you here? And so here, the rich, the powerful, they came to bathe, they came to eat, they came to discuss religion, politics, and power in this most exquisite and exclusive, luxurious country club with walls to keep this sumptuous lifestyle exclusive to the priesthood. <laughs> and excluding the rank and file. Hallelujah. And what was the name then? What was the name? Talk to me, people of God. Talk to me. Virgin will. The virgin's well, the virgin's well. Thank you. So, the hot spring, this hot spring caused life to flow into this pool. And this was the attraction for the priesthood because it was a flowing stream, a hot stream. The, it was life. It, it brought life. It, it flowed. And this was the attraction. Okay. All right. So, so much for the history lesson. Now, let's go back to scriptures. By Jesus' day, in our text in John 5, the picture had dramatically changed. The priesthood is gone. They have abandoned all their money, their investment, and this place, this wonderful place with five porches, had fallen into disrepair. And instead of it being the place for the high and mighty, the rich and the famous, you know, the influencers and the all that, it had now been taken over by sick people. And not just sick people with headaches, but people who were critically ill, people with chronic diseases, what we would call today incurable diseases. Why? What happened? What happened? What happened to the priesthood? Why did they abandon this, their vast investment? You know the answer? The spring dried up. The spring stopped flowing. It dried up. Now, when the spring dried up and the water ceased to flow, to gush out from the earth, into the pool, uh, the life in the water died. So now fresh water was not coming into this their lovely pool anymore. So the first thing that happened was the water turned cold. <laughs> uh, uh, and then it lost its appeal. And then because no fresh water was coming in, so no fresh water was flowing out, the water became a stagnant, still, motionless, dead body of water. Hmm. It's amazing how, do you know that as beautiful as your house is, one of the things that makes your house remain beautiful is the fact that you are living in it. Life. It's life that makes your house alive. 
do you know if you if you travel for six months and leave your house, by the time you come back, it will be many things would have, would have been de degenerate would have degenerated, even though they have not been touched or used. So life, listen to me, church, listen to me. Life has this habit of giving life. Life bequeaths life. When the waters of life stopped flowing, everything became dank. Everything became stagnant, stale, motionless, rancid, fungus reading, algae infested. Is anybody getting the picture? So, remember that Jerusalem's weather was stifling or asphyxiatingly hot. That is, chokingly hot. It was very hot. So, the well became, first of all, brown. And then it became slimy green. And then guess what? Because the waters were not flowing anymore, mosquitoes and insects all over the place. And sick people were there slapping away mosquitoes and flies and insects of all kinds. So what happened? The priesthood, what happened to the priesthood? They left. They aban abandoned their virgins well. So what happened? The tiles began to fall. The artwork began to deteriorate. The marbles began to crack. And then the doors and windows began to be boarded. And the whole utopia became a hellhole. But by John 5, people had gone to remove the boardings. <laughs> And this totally derelict, decrepit, dilapidated, desolate, run-down, five covered porches have been invaded by, let's go to verse 3 of our text, John 5, 3. So this, this place has been invaded by a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered. So for where for every one lovely, rich, famous cohort of clerics who had cavorted and chatted and chewed and conferred in convoluted consanguinity, which means that they gathered together in, you know, in, 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 in fellowship. They now lay what? Sick people everywhere, people in bandages, people in crutches, people on stretchers. The Bible says a great multitude. That is a large number of sick people piled. Maybe some on top of another with hardly space in between. Now let's look at the groups of people that the Bible tells us were there. It says there were four categories of people. Impotent folk. Impotent folk. People so critically ill, they have lost their strength. That is, people very, very, very weak and close to death, barely able to move. That's what important folk are. People who are very weak by reason of infirmity, so weak that they can barely move. They are so weak, they are close to death. They have, they've lost all their strength. Does that sound like you sometimes? Does that sound like somebody you know sometimes? Does that sound like, you know, our society sometimes? Does it sound like things that happen around you sometimes where people are, are just so, they're so beaten down by the things that they have been through that they have absolutely no strength left? Is somebody here with me this morning? So important folk. Then the next group of people is blind, visually impaired. I think we understand that one. Hmm. 
But we also know that there is another degree, there's another level of blindness, people who, who are spiritually blind. Then the third category of people is those who are halt, halt. Halt simply means crippled. They have only one leg or one leg is shorter than the other or they have no foot or they have they, they are amputees or, you know, uh, they, 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 you know, just they, they, they're crippled in one degree or the other. And then the fourth category is those who are withered. And withered simply means paralyzed, paralyzed. They cannot, they, their spine, they have a spinal injury that means they cannot respond, their, their parts of their body cannot respond to the command from their brains. So impotent folk, blind, halt, withered. So, church, question. Why are these people so sick, so impaired, so crippled, so paralyzed? Why are they all gathering around a pool of cold, stagnant water in a dank, rank, algae-ridden, mosquito-infested environment? Why? Why would people gather around in such an environment? Is this the kind of place where sick people should be? Shouldn't they be in a hospital or a hospice or at home being properly looked after by their families and friends? Verse 3 tells us why. It says all these impotent folk, blind, old, withered, were waiting for the moving of the water. Now, that's a very interesting question point. Why should they be waiting for the movement of stagnant, stale, immobile water? Why? Why would they be waiting for that? Now, it is very clear that the water doesn't move. It cannot move. The spring is dead. It's dried up long, long ago. And so no water is flowing in and no water is flowing out. That's it. Now, because it's a covered place, because there are the porches, the, even the wind cannot get in to stir up the water. So you can't say, oh, it's the wind that is stirring up the water. What was its original name? The Virgin's Well. The Virgin's Well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But now it is called Bethesda in the Hebrew. Bethesda. Remember what I told you Bethesda means? House of kindness, mercy, flowing water. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. I, I, I'm going to keep asking questions, so you better be ready. I'm not, I'm not just going to be talking and talking like, uh, like uh, those radios of the past, you know. <laughs> Uh, remember those radios that they had only one one station, and you just switch it on, and to just be talking. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So it is now called Bethesda, the house of mercy, the house of goodness, the house of flowing water. What an irony! The water has stopped flowing, and yet the place is called what? House of flowing water. Why? Why? What? What happened here? The religious people abandoned the place. The sick moved in. And the sick called it Bethesda. Why? Why did they call it the house of mercy? They called it the house of mercy because the power of God showed up in this place. Somebody say hallelujah. Ha! Huh. I love this. I love this because the Bible says where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. Now, in the natural, the picture is a picture of dereliction, of, of destitution, of desolation, of every nasty thing. And yet, the power of God, because the Bible says, where sin abounds, grace does not work. The power of God showed up in this place. God's power has a penchant for showing up in the most unlikely places and at the most unlikely time. In the on the most unlikely people, somebody say amen to that. Amen, amen, amen. Now, question 
What is the connection between these sick people, the dilapidated structure, and the name Bethesda? So what, what's the connection? So there's sick people, there's a dilapidated structure where they are. So sick people in a dilapidated structure, then house of mercy. What's the connection? Why are they focusing? Why are these people focusing on this stagnant, stale water? Verse 4 tells us. Verse 4. Verse 4. It says, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Wow. 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 No wonder they were focusing on the water. Now, Listen to this. Listen to this. When you read the scriptures and you read all the notes that uh, follow it, some biblical scholars and some Bibles will footnote that verse four, telling you that it is not available. It's not. It's not in most of the older manuscripts. That it doesn't exist. So some modern scholars say we should therefore expunge it from our accounts. They also claim it was only a rumor, for nobody ever saw or claimed to see the angel okay be that as it may be that as it may i it, 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 it they may that verse may not be there but <laughs> something happened at sporadic intervals in that place that made people gather there in expectation hmm? so my question is this. If no one ever saw an angel, why did they believe that one was there or one came at a at material moment to, 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 at, at sporadic intervals? Why? Why at random intervals? Why? Why did they believe that? Now remember that this water was dead and covered so that not even the wind could affect it. Nothing. It was, it was dead. It couldn't move. It's like you having a bucket of, of water in, in your, 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 your sealed bathroom that has no windows and no, 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 the wind cannot come in. And then suddenly that bucket begins to bubble and to, to stir up. You, something's happening there. Are you here? What happened was that there were seasons. Again, this brings us to times and seasons. There were seasons when the water would be stirred up supernaturally. It wasn't natural. Nobody was touching it. Nobody was doing anything. Nobody was stirring it up. The wind or the elements were not able to do it. But something was happening that was stirring up the water. See, if it is wind, please notice. I like the way the Bible, the Bible is very, very clear. It says the water is stirred up. It didn't say, you see, if it's wind, when wind goes over water, what does it do? It, there's a ripple effect, ripple. You just, so you see the, the water just going, rippling, rippling. But this was this was like a tornado. It's, it's, it's tearing up. So it can't be the wind. <laughs> Woo, somebody say glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> a well, that's it. Thank you, Gerald. Well pulled. That's it. Hmm. An angel troubled the water. I checked up that word troubled. It says agitated, stirred. That is stick something in and stir. So that's what you do when you are making your eba or your gari or, or, or your pounded yam or your uh, mashed potatoes. You there, There's water. The water is boiling. Then you pour in the, 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 the mashed potatoes or the pounded yam flakes and then you begin to stir it, to stir it, you know. That's that's what happened with this water. So now the, 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 the issue was these seasons were unpredictable. And suddenly it would appear that the water was being stirred aggressively and violently as if the tip of a tornado had hit it. So that, that's exactly what happened. It would be as if a tornado, you know when, when a tornado hits 
and you see the wind blowing like that, and you see the waters tearing up like that in that uh, violent way. That's what was happening. Now, church, the people knew. You and I know that this was not natural. And so something external was stirring the water. The sick folk chose to believe it was an angel. They also believed that special powers were released at this time, and whoever would enter first after this stirring would be healed of whatever church. Remember, these are critically in, in they're critically infirm, critically sick people. They're not people with mild diseases. Whatever infirmity they had as well suffered from. How did they know when the water? What, what, what was the question? How did they know when the water? I, I didn't see the last rest of the question. It was taken away before. What was the question? Um, fake? Or was it fake or Casey? Unmute and ask it. Oh, sorry. It's me, Pastor Space. Um, I was just saying, how did they know when the water stirred that it was for healing and not for something else? I, well, I guess somebody must have stepped in and was healed at uh, the first time. Mm, okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's from experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From experience. Yeah. And then the testimony of all the people who, it, it, you see, the interesting thing was maybe one, it started with one homeless. I'm, I'm just, this is conjecture, conjecture, purely conjecture. Maybe one very critically ill person whose family had abandoned him just went and stayed in that place by the water. And then one day he was dead, the water was dead, and he was healed. He came out and started shouting. So, uh, so mm. everybody started to gather. You know, that's all it takes. It just takes one person to, to share testimony. So somebody must have. And then when it was stirred up the next time, somebody stepped in and they were healed. And then it happened again. And so they, they, were, they were now living, people who were living proof. So now the question is this. They believe. Yes, yes, my dear. Yes. My Sorry, dear. I have a follow-on question. Um, yes. I guess my what I'm also thinking is how do we know when it's being superstitious and when it's actually God? Like you know, if you are sick and mm. what I the water said and you jump in and you are healed. Mm. I, me, I, I believe that that's God. I <laughs> I, I don't think that that's superstition. <laughs> <laughs> and when is the mother what person is happening to other people then yes it and, and then it's not that they are saying if I do something then God will do something yeah. no it is the water yeah. being said and you entering into it so you mm. didn't stir the water you didn't you didn't chance into the water you didn't mm -hmm. uh, evoke or invoke anything into the water the water was mm -hmm. dead so um, yeah okay. That, that, okay. that's yeah so thank you Yes, thank you, Faith. Now, it's interesting. Oh, my camera has moved. Where did it move to? Just moved to the side, Pastor. So, yeah, that's better. That's better. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, let me come to the center a little. Let me center, center myself a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Now, the people... Now they believe that the first person that jumped in would be healed. Guess what, church? They were right and they were wrong. Why were they right? They had evidence to show that everybody who jumped into the water first was healed. Why were they, why were they wrong? I think they were wrong to believe that only one person could have been healed. My contention, my belief, if I know this God that we serve, is that all could have been healed. You see, Hebrews, uh, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he's no respecter of persons, I believe that by faith, you, you will know that it works for, every, for everybody. So today, when we need healing, all right, what do we do? We look back 
to the cross, realizing that healing is an integral part of the salvation package. It's part of the atonement. I'm going to say that again because I don't think anybody heard me. Because if somebody had heard me, they would have shouted, Hallelujah, glory to God. Yes. Today, when we need healing, we look back to the cross, realizing that healing is an integral part of the salvation package. It is a critical part of the atonement. You see, you cannot talk of atonement and not realize that it involves healing. You can't talk of, you see, we don't even understand forgiveness of sin, how much more healing, but it's all a part of the package. That's why we're told in Isaiah 53 that by his stripes, we are healed. I am healed. I am healed. Amen. I am healed. So let's do what John, the beloved, said. I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Eh? By his stripes, it's not we. I, Omar Omi Michael Efue, I am healed. I am healed by his stripes. You see, if I do not appropriate it, it's not going to work. So the problem was that in John, there was no cross for Jesus had not yet died. So the people could only by faith just look forward to something which Abraham looked forward to uh, this sacrifice. He looked forward to the God who, who, who caused the things that are not as though they are and raises the dead. So my question is then, how did these people get healed if Jesus had not yet died? How did they get healed? There was no cross, there was no stripes. There was no chastisement that, that, that secured our peace. Yet, listen to me, church, God wanted to heal them as much as he wants to heal us today. How do I know that? Somebody tell me, how do I know that? Tell me. Oh, come on. Somebody talk to me. Nobody's talking to me. How do you know that? Because yes. he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you. That's it. It's the same. It doesn't change. He doesn't have favorites. He doesn't now decide that, oh, I like this group more than I like that group, or I like this generation more than I like that generation. So where you guys can die and these ones can live. He is this, he wants the same yesterday. He wants to heal them as much as he wants to heal us. It's the same. So because Jesus had not yet died, he was he was going to have to use something what is he going to how, how are they going to access something that was not yet available <laughs> you remember the woman whose daughter was grievously vexed with the devil she came to jesus she said my daughter jesus said it, jesus first ignored her then he now said look i am not sent to the the dogs i i'm sent to the she said yeah yeah i agree i understand that but you're merciful. The dogs even eat the crumbs that fall from the table. So I, I may not be, it may not be time for me to access this blessing, but it's always time for me to access your mercy. So the reason, the, what was at work here was the mercy of God. Bethesda, Bethesda, the mercy of God. That's why the sick people called the, the, that place Bethesda. The house of mercy. The house of God's kindness. The house of where, even though the natural water is dank and stale, God's mercy will cause flowing waters. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. No wonder... You see, now I begin to understand certain statements that Jesus made. He said, whosoever believes in me, out of his belly would flow a hot spring, a virgin's well would flow out of anybody who believes. So this place, this Bethesda, was a place where God 
showed special mercy. Where God had created a place in the very heart of the city. Now watch this, church. Watch this. I told you at the onset, I said, it was not by mistake. Listen to me, church. It wasn't by mistake that this well was next to the temple. God intended that the well and the temple should work together. But the priests hijacked the well and they had also hijacked what? The temple. <laughs> uh -huh. So, in the temple, listen to me, church, where people should have been coming to encounter God and find healing, instead, what were the rulers doing? What were they doing? They were selling and buying. They had <laughs> they, they were hijackers. <laughs> Jero says they are hijackers. They had hijacked it and they were now using it for merchandising. They were now buying and selling oh, holy oil and a uh, mantle and all the things. They were selling stuff to exploit the people. So the people couldn't come to the temple to receive healing. Then the place that was next to it that they should have had, they couldn't go there. So what did God do? God created a place next to the temple, that temple which should have served, but was now a place of merchandising. So rather, what did God do? This man-forsaken place became a God-ordained environment where faith would rise up and people could come and faith would be released so that God's mercy could heal incurably sick people. So the cross had not yet happened. So what did God do? He created a special situation. Blessed be our God. What, what a mighty, wonderful God we serve. What a glorious God. So sometimes, even if... You, you, you don't have access to, to certain things. God makes a provision, a special provision for you. Glory to God in the highest. There was no power in the water. You see, listen to me, church. There was no power in the water. Water never healed and can never heal anybody. There was no magic in the water. You know, water has no magical powers as the people erroneously thought. It was not the water. The water just created a moment, a kairos moment, an environment, a presence that would cause the faith of the sick people to arise. Sometimes God would just cause, you know, just he would engineer a situation that would make your faith arise so that you come into a situation and you are healed. When they saw the agitation of the water, they knew that something supernatural was happening so they could be healed. So what happened was they released their faith. Everybody at that place released their faith at the same time. But the, the sad thing is they thought that this faith is for the first person to enter into this water. So when they touched the water, when that first person touched the water, it became a moment, what we call in biblical parlance, a point of contact. Somebody say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, this is good stuff. I, I don't know. This is, this is very good stuff for me. As I was thinking about this, I was like, wow, 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 wow. Okay. We'll take a 10-minute break. <laughs> uh, are, are you enjoying this? I, I am. Um, and it's, uh, it, it says, just to get clarity, are you saying that healing only occurred in the New Testament? No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that um, just like um, he, he, uh, salvation occurred in the Old Testament, but it occurred by faith. Um, people, people had to trust in uh, animal sacrifices to cover sins. They had to, you know, uh, they believed in a Messiah that was coming. So they were looking forward. So by faith, yes. But you notice that universal healing 
was not something that was, it was available, but it was not commonplace because um, the, the, the cross, Jesus hadn't gone to the cross. So what happened was there were a special occasions, special instances, special uh, graces and giftings where those healing anointings flowed. But it was not it was not as commonplace as it, it as it it should be now. <laughs> okay, because of this. So I, I hope that answers the question. All right. So the last thing I said was when the people saw the agitation of the water, they knew they could be healed and they released their faith. And as soon as they touched the water, it, it became a moment, it became a point of contact. It became a way to reach into uh, that which God had, um, you know, So you're on mute. You're on mute. Okay. All right. Is that all muted now? Yeah. yeah I don't know how it muted. I didn't mute it. <laughs> okay. It, it's I've lost. Aha, there it is. Okay. Good. Good. Yes. I've got my. I got it back. Yes. Thank you. Got it back. Okay. So, um, this this uh moments this this times of. When, when faith is released, it happened a lot. You see, you see instances of it in the old covenant, and you see instances of it in as Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and all, all the, uh, the, the, the areas where he, he frequented. So it, it's what happened to the woman with the issue of blood, for example. Let, let's go to Matthew 9:20. Matthew 9:20. If somebody can read it for me quickly, Matthew 9:20. So somebody read it quickly, quickly. And then somebody else read Mark 5.28, which is... And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came yeah. behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Mm. Amen. Amen. You see, she had an issue of blood and, and, and she, she came and, and she said within herself, if I may but touch, and she came and she touched. Mark 5.28, I think is the same account. Mark 5, 528. Mark 5, 28, for she yes. said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Amen. If I may but touch, see, just a point of contact, I shall be whole. All right. Amen. Now we know that. Okay, now let's go to Mark 6, 56. Mark 5, 6, 56. The Bible says, and whithersoever he entered, he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. Amen. Now we know, just like these people, they, 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 when they jumped into the water, they were made whole. And you, we know that it is not the garment, it's not Jesus' garment that healed them. We know that. Uh, it, it was their faith. It was that releasing that faith in that moment. But they needed something, a point of contact. They needed a, a house of mercy. They needed something to connect. You know, it's very important. You, you can see. So now, hallelujah. We make the mistake of thinking that if I can get a handkerchief, I shall be healed. If I can drink this holy water, I shall be healed. If I can just get to that crusade ground, I shall be healed. If I can just get Benny Hinn to touch me, I shall be healed. That's the mistake we're making. It's an it, it's Old Testament mindset. It's an Old Testament mindset. You know, we're thinking, we're thinking just like those people that if I can just get to this house, this Bethesda, house of praise, uh, of mercy, I shall be healed. Okay. Uh, so this is exactly what happens at crusades, revival meetings, even at services like at, at gatherings like this. You know, people come with a prefixed point of contact to say, if Benny Hinn lays hands on me, I will be healed. If T.L. Osborne does this, I will be, you know, if they have that 
point of contact, preconception. Okay. So this is exactly what was happening in John 5. The people believe that. Yes. Sorry, two questions, sir. Yeah. The, 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 the first question is in the chat. Jerry asked it. The second question is, um, please, who is T.L. Osborne? <laughs> for those of us who are okay. young. I'm so young. sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm ancient of this. <laughs> <laughs> T.L. Osborne is a good... I, I don't even know whether he's still alive. Is he still alive? No, he's gone. He's been, he's it's gone. gone. Okay. Yeah, he was one of the great uh, evangelists like uh, Billy Graham and, uh, you know, they, they, they were... They were great, great uh, preachers and evangelists who, who touched you, generations. I just, I just want you to clarify for those of us. It's who true. Are Thank you. I, you know, we, you, I, I, you as you people know a lot of these things, but we, you know, we don't even know how old we are these days. Mm. Yeah. The, second, the first question is in the in the chat. Um, Jiro asked a question. <laughs> okay. Well, let me said, let me check. It then. What does said, it um, Pastor, so all my handkerchief that touch you, what do I do with them? <laughs> and the rosary that the Pope blessed. <laughs> and the holy water that is in my in my store. <laughs> and the holy oil. You know, one of my do you know one of my nieces who's a believer, born again believer? We were praying for something in our house. She was living with us. And she said to me, she said, if I don't go to uh, Canaan land and let uh Uyedeku, bless oil and this thing for me that the thing will not happen. I say, I bind you and the spirit that is speaking in you in Jesus' name. I bind all of you. And the, the oil that the person gave you and everything, I bind all of you together. <sighs> I was so angry. <laughs> but, um, so, they believed when the water was there, they would be healed. So, it therefore became the moment when they released their faith. So, Benny Hinn's meetings, for example, have become contact points for healings. It, and it's good. We, we don't have a problem with people, you know, having a point, contact point and healing. But they must realize that it is not Benny Hinn. It is not the crusade. It is because people's faith is stirred up in Jesus, the Christ, the healer, and that they are seeing an environment where that is, is, is manifested. Okay. Uh, Billy Graham's meetings, even now, they still have crusades, even though he's gone, they still have crusades that have become contact points for salvation, uh, uh, like as a T.L. Osborne's and all that, you know. Uh, Kenneth Hagin, they, they were also uh, school of faith, the teachers of, of this uh, school of faith, Kenneth Copeland, um, you know. Um, in this generation, T.D. Jakes, when you talk of hope, you know, he, he's, a, he's a preacher of hope, you know, so so this is exactly what happened in Jesus' ministry. His meetings became a point of contact for many. People had heard so much about him, so they began to have to prefix their faith. They began to say, okay, yeah, if I, if I can only get to one of those meetings, if I can, you know, uh, Mark 5.27, the, the woman said, when she, the Bible says, when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the in the press behind and touched his garment because she said, "If I may but touch," you see. So the truth is the same faith that works in the miracle meetings in the crusade grounds could work at home, but because people prefix their faith, it becomes a moment when their faith is released. Okay. Now I don't have any problem with crusades. You know, you have to go to crusades. You have to go to you know that faith is released. There's, there's when people come together. Bible says we shouldn't forsake the assembly together. So if we come together for healings, that's good because we we release faith for healing. We do everybody. So that, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to a crusade ground. I'm, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to a meeting. I'm only saying that don't put your faith in those crusade grounds, don't put your faith in, it's still the faith in Christ Jesus. And then certainly don't do the superstitious things of taking, you know, necessarily uh, having to take an oil, uh, 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 taking oil, taking this or that and that. It's the faith in Jesus. Jesus only had to show up in, in places and because he had done so much, the Bible says it was noised abroad that he was around. And so he became a point of contact. And so just touching, just hearing, just being where he was, uh, things would happen. So back to our text. So in John 5, God is 
helping these people that are create a moment in which they can reach out and get what, listen to this, what God so longed to give them. <laughs> the thing is that God was not reluctant. It wasn't as if, oh, God didn't want to heal them and they were trying to force God's hand, you know. God was yearning for them to catch a revelation that he is the God who heals. And therefore, they would reach out and they would be healed. Now, the problem, it's just a pity that the teachers of the law, the people who should have been teaching the people faith, you know, they, didn't, they were not there. They had abandoned their duty posts. They could have taught those people that not one person, but all can be healed. So when the angel stirred the water and mercy miracles took place, uh, hence the name Bethesda, they should have told the people, hey, listen, why doesn't somebody else step in and receive? And another person, why don't we step in, everybody? It's, it's, it's a free flow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So, um, so now, coming back, I was asking you, why are these people gathering? So this explains why all the sick people aggregated here. They were all hoping to be the next recipient of the miracle. Okay? The Bible says faith is the substance of the things you hope for. Okay? So verses 5 and 6, we are in the text, in Matthew, in uh, uh, John 5. We are introduced to a certain man who had been sick for how many years again? 38 years. Yeah. 38 years. Church, that's a long time to be sick. And if you know anything about sickness, you will realize that sickness, especially prolonged ones, affect not just your body, but they affect your mind and your emotions too. They affect your sense of self-worth. They affect your sense of significance. They affect your security. They affect the essence of who you are. Are you here? So when Jesus talked of being whole, when he said, will you be made whole? He was not only concerned with this person's body. Hmm? Catch this revelation. Now, he didn't say, do you want to be healed? He said, do you want to be made whole? In other words, Jesus began to show, he said, I am, I am concerned about the state of your mind. I'm concerned about your emotions. I'm concerned about your Self, your sense of self-worth. Hallelujah. You see, church, if you've ever been sick, if you've ever been bedridden for any length of time, you know that it affects you physically, bed sores, etc., etc. It affects you mentally. You begin to feel less than a human being. If it affects you emotionally. It affects your conversation. All you want to talk about is sickness and that. It affects your orientation. You actually begin to see the world from a perspective of sickness and infirmity. It affects your worldview. You see, does anybody know how long a generation is? According to scriptures, a generation is how many years? Is it 42 years, Pastor? Yeah, it's about 40. Yeah. Yeah. So you're on, you're, you're smack on. So church, this man had been sick for a whole lifetime, a generation, a full generation. That's the, 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 the time frame of one generation. When they say generation X, 40 years, generation Y, 40 years, generation, you know, he had been sick for the entire period of a generation. He had also been waiting at this pool of Bethesda for its miracle for so long. And it still had not come. So picture this man. He had seen other people come. He had seen other people go. 
He had seen people healed in these times, and he is still infirm. He's still waiting for his miracle. This is where he was when Jesus, for no apparent explicable reason, so for and no, no, no real reason that anybody could understand, comes to this place where there are denizens of despair, these inhabitants of a hell hole, this, this ragtag forsaken army. Jesus comes into their midst and he asks the same question he is still asking us today. Will thou be made whole? Mm. Hallelujah. Okay, so uh, let's 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 begin. Let's discuss. We can. There's a there's the second part of it, but. If I, if I start the second part now, <laughs> I'm not sure how it will go. So let, let's begin to talk. Let's talk about the things that we have learned so far. And let's see where it gets us today. And then we'll conclude this message in our next session. So can, shall, we, shall we begin to talk? Pastor, I think Faith had a question. Faith? Yes. Fire away, Faith. Please. Um, so I know we we're just jesting about the handkerchiefs and stuff, but um, the scripture that came to mind, I just posted it in the chat and it was in Acts 19.12. Um, and it says, when the handkerchiefs or aprons that were merely touched his skin, this Peter, um, were placed on sick people, they were healed of, of their disease and evil spirits were expelled. So is there a place for that whole sort of ministry? Or are we making a doctrine out of something? Yes, that thou askest the very interesting question. All right, now it's it's it is very important. Um, I, I was reading. Let, let, let's let's go to. Let, let let's go back to the scriptures. I think it it sometimes helps. Some of the the ways to answer some of these questions is through. Let me sorry. I'm just trying to dig up my. Um, let's go to Acts nineteen eleven. Okay, that's that's the that's the you you gave verse twelve, right? Faith. Yes. Yes. yes, I you, did. You, yes. you see, that's why it's so important to always go back. A little bit and look at things in context. context. Yeah. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, And God wrought special, special miracles by the hand of Paul, so that from his body were, were brought onto the sick handkerchiefs. Special. Okay. God wrought special. Okay. I don't know what that says to you. Let, let's look at other translations and see. Okay. Um, let me see. I just, I just want to see what that, what special, what it translates to. Some, some say unusual. Some say extraordinary. Extraordinary. Unusual. Unusual. Um, okay. Very special miracles. Okay. Um, great miracles. I don't know whether that's unusual. In relation to other miracles or unusual in the sense that it's not natural <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay litv says and god did uncommon works of power through your hands of four okay all right mm. so anyhow mm -hmm. um again knowing that god is no respecter of persons and all that and that what he does for one, he'll do for others. But I think, again, it's at his word. 
Mm. I think it's at his word. I don't think, you see, he didn't say, this sign shall follow them that believe. They shall take handkerchiefs from their body and lay it on the sick and the sick will recover. He didn't say, he said, this sign shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out their voice. They will lay hands on the sick, they will recover. Okay, so there are only two things that he prescribes as being standard procedure, laying hands on the sick, anointing them with oil. Those are the, the only two things that are prescribed, you know. So everything else is licensed. It depends on obedience. It depends. So if God tells you to knock somebody's head three times, pow, 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 and you knock his head and he's dis- del- delivered up. Even if God tells you to punch him hard and he's healed of his cancer, I don't think he's going to sue you for punching him hard. But then, the fact that God told you to punch him hard, for reasons only God knows, you don't now make have a crusade and everybody who has cancer, come, po, pa. <laughs> you know, that's the problem we have. That, that's always the problem. God gives us an instruction for one person. We take it, make a doctrine of it for everybody. And then some, because of the mercy of God, it works for some time and then it starts working. Then we now have to start manipulating it. We now have to start manipulating it. We now have to start paying people so that it will work. Or we now have to find a way to make it work even when God is not in it, you know? Uh So I think that's, the the problem is making a doctrine out of it. I don't think there's a a problem with people. You you lay handkerchief on somebody and they being healed if God told you to do it. But it didn't say that it was, it, it, that was a precondition that was required for people to be healed. I don't think so. We have to be careful about that. Yeah, I I understand. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, Faith, by the way, that, that question is so important because all of us are confused. We are all confused about it and we all do strange things sometimes because mm-hmm. we saw people doing it and all that. So it's 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 just it is that's why we're actually that's one of the reasons God gave me this message for us to deal because it, they are just issues that need to be dealt with mm. in our lives you know that we've been confused by many things that we have seen heard and done in the mm. past so it, it now needs to put some clarity to it give some you know yeah, mm. yeah. thank you Pastor. thank you thank you Faith. thank you for So I just wanted to say that, um, just to add to that as well, that I think also the challenge then becomes, as you said, when God gives instruction for one scenario, and then we make it a doctrine across, what then tends to happen is that people then begin, as you've already mentioned when you were teaching earlier, people begin to put their faith in that particular thing rather mm-hmm. than in, in Christ. So yeah, that, that's what will let that person say to you, to you for instance, that except I go to um, and there's nothing wrong with Pastor Yediko, by the way. You know, nothing is, wrong. I did, I, did, I did. Yes. That, this is why the person would say, except I go to him and he prays about this oil. Da, da, da. Mm. So they realize the faith has shifted from God's word and from Christ to the oil, and they need for that oil to be, you know, and that's yeah. the, the challenge and the problem comes from. I don't necessarily think that, yeah. Yeah. I just want to add that. Yes. And just another thing, um, uh, you know, I, I was talking to one of my daughters. Um, who's not she's not in, in Chapel of Life you know so and she was telling me that there's I, I mentioned this before that there's this new guy that is praying every morning and everybody's praying and all that and they're praying every day and all kinds of miracles are happening and, and things like that and that she, she, she joins the prayers every morning and I said okay that's, that's good I said so the prayers are all for always for miracles and then yeah she said well I, it's just miracle that the miracles are flowing and everything. Um, so I said, okay. Then she said, but I, the only problem I have is that when the people are giving testimonies, they now say, ah, you, Pastor so and so, I can't remember what his name is, Joe or somebody. Pastor so and so said it and then it happened. You know, Pastor so and so did this. And, and, I, and she said, so I, I'm a little uncomfortable about the fact that, you know, it's all, it's all about. Uh, I said, aha, uh, okay. Oh, well. You know, and, and and I said, so how long do you intend to be joining the prayer every morning to be praying 
for needs, to my needs, prayer for, for fire, fire, prayer, you know, let's, you know, I, I don't know how, how, how long, when are you going to mature and be the one who is praying for other people's needs instead of you joining a prayer meeting to pray for your needs, you know? Um, so I, I, I think that apart from the elements, there's also the person. Glory begins to go to people instead of to the Christ. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? And I guess going back to what you said, Pastor O, you know, in, in, in the scripture, we often see sometimes where um, even the layman and he was waiting to be carried and stuff. And I guess God's just reminding us, like, let's not get so in love with the miracle that we forget mm -hmm. God, you know, that it really should always go back to him. And I guess as I'm thinking about that scripture, I'm thinking for those people who were sick, maybe that's where their faith was at that level where they needed something mm -hmm. physical they could touch, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, just a thought. Yeah, that, that's true. So we, we have to be very careful that, yeah. And, and, and yeah, and it's okay for people to be at different levels of uh, maturity. There's no, no problem. I don't think God has a problem with that at all, you know. Um, and he, he meets you at the very point of your need. But the problem is he doesn't want you to stay at the point of your need. You know, he doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to grow up in Christ in all things. Grow up into Christ in all things. He wants you to, the Bible says, the path of the just shines brighter and brighter unto perfection. He wants you to go to maturity, to perfection. He wants you, he said, um, uh, there were certain, Paul said, there are certain things I couldn't say to you because you were, uh, yes, to move from milk to meat. There were certain things I wanted to talk to you, but you were not able to hear them. He says, now, you know, I, I, I was giving you milk, but you, you need strong meat. Now it's time for you to move on to other things. He says, it, it, when you should be teachers, that's what I would say about those morning prayers where you are going. You should be teachers. You sh people should be logging into your prayer meeting so that you can pray for the sick. Not that you, who by now should be healing others, are logging, still logging in into a, a prayer group where hundreds of thousands are go just for hele bere be kuraba, liki liki liki, liki liki liki, liki. And you're like, how many liki liki? How many things are you going to lick? You are get, get on with this your life you know when are you when are you going to begin to teach others when are you going to begin to say look look on us and then point them to jesus you know that's 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 my that's i think that's the problem that god has with this uh, issue you know yeah so pastor yes um there, there is a i have them um, well anthony has a question that she wants me to ask <laughs> but, have a quarter. but there's also another question on the Thread. Yeah. I think maybe we should um, deal with that first and then I'll... Okay, answer. all right. It says, good morning, Pastor. I was wondering if someone doesn't get healed at a crusade or have been praying and they don't, they don't get healed, does it mean that they don't have enough faith or is it possible that it, is, it isn't the will of God? Woo! <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, well, okay. What is the will of God. What is the will of God? The will of God is the counsel of God. The will of God is the desire of God. So let's 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 start off with the basic, the most basic of God's will, the most basic thing of God's will. Uh, let, let's let's see if we can find that scripture where it says. Uh, God does not want any to perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of Jesus. What, what scripture is that? Somebody help me. Um, can somebody please find it if you can, please? It's uh, Second Peter. Okay, so three, let's go there. Nine. Let's go there. Let's go there quickly. Second Peter three nine. Thank you, brother Tim. Thank you so much. Second Peter 3, 9. It says, all right. 
uh, I like I like the preceding verse, so I'm going to read it just just to give some pattern. It says, "But but beloved, that's you and I. Hello, beloved. Hello, beloved of the Lord. Hello, Pastor. Hi. Hello, uh, Pastor. Uh -huh. Hello. You see, when Brother Olu says he's the one that J Jesus loves, we look at him strangely. But this is it. This is it. This is what this scripture is saying." Beloved means the disciple that Jesus loved. It says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now, it's very interesting. I didn't intend to even use this scripture. I just saw it as a pretext to water. But you ask the question that when somebody is praying and they don't get healed immediately, is it that God doesn't want them healed or it's not the will of God? All right. So this this scripture answers that question that one day with the Lord is as a thousand, a thousand. So sometimes there's a timing to the healing. There's a timing to everything. For everything, there's a timing. You see, this guy had been ill. This man at the pool of, of Bethesda had been ill for 38 years. Okay. Now, in year one of his illness, did God want him to be healed? Of course, year two, year three, year four, and so on. But there was a timing to when God, Jesus saw the time when God healed him and Jesus healed him. So uh, it's a year with the Lord is a thousand years, a day with the Lord, sorry, is a thousand, a thousand years a day. Now verse nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the, this is very clearly the will of God. The will of God is that everybody should come to repentance. Everybody should be saved. That's the will of God. Is everybody saved? No. Will everybody be saved? No. Why? When it is the will of God. It's because... God created us in his image and gave us the right of choice. He gave us the right. So there are some people who don't want to be saved. They refuse salvation. I, I, I tell you, guys, I've told you guys this story. And it, it just, I, I, it, it's one of those things that just really, my, one of my uncles, very close uncle, my father's cousin, and very, very close, very close. He stayed in our house. We stayed in his, his children. We are, we are very close, as close as you can get. And I remember when he was terminally ill, uh, some of his children had become Christians and they were trying to get him to repent. And this man was, all he was doing was talking about what, how good, a, how great a lawyer he was. In these last days, which is that, knowing that he was terminally ill, he, he, they were trying to get him to repent and give his life to God. He was talking about how great a lawyer, all the wonderful things he had achieved. That's what the man was talking about on his deathbed. When God was trying to get him to say, look, you have a chance now. You, are, you know you are dying. You have a chance. Pride and whatever else, the, whatever covenant or self they've entered into with the devil. Pride is talking about, I'm talking, I'm telling you, you are not going to be a lawyer where you are going. You are not going to be a lawyer. You're not going to be a great lawyer where you are going. You are going to be naked. You're about to. My heart just, my heart cried when I, you know, I thought about that. So um, to come back to the question. God's will is revealed in his word. And in his word, he says, he wants us saved and he wants us healed and he wants us to prosper. And there's a scripture that captures every, that captures those three dimensions. He said, beloved, I think it's dead John 2 or something. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health 
even as thy soul prospereth. So God wants you to prosper. When he says that thou mayest, thou is, is the thou is you, man is a spirit. So you are a spirit man. So when he says, I, 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 beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. He's talking about your spirit man because that's the real you. I want, I pray that your spirit man should prosper and that you will be in health. That is your body. Even as your soul prospereth, that is your mind, your intellect, your emotions, your will. I want you to prosper in those three dimensions of your, that is the revealed will of God. So God doesn't want you to be sick. God doesn't want you to be poor. And God doesn't want you to be an unbeliever. All right. So question, why then, uh, uh, third John, yes, uh, one, two. Why then are we not being healed? Why are we not prospering? In the, what is the problem? The problem is not with God. The problem is with us. It's because the, my people are perishing because of lack of knowledge. They don't know what the things that have been freely given to us, the things that pertain to life and godliness. We don't know that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is, is resident inside of us. And that if that spirit lives in us, he will quickly make alive our mortal bodies. We don't know. We don't know that we're in a fallen world. Therefore, we're subject. We're, we are, we are, um, we are subject to the influences of the, of the natural earth, but we don't have to be controlled by them. We, 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 you see, when you ask you, how are you doing? Say, how are you doing, bro? How are you doing, sister? Say, under the circumstances. Under which circumstances? Who told you you're supposed to be under certain circumstances? Who told you? Who told you? You are above, not underneath. You see, some of the words we use are death-inspiring words. They are words that bring death, that reinforce the natural things around us that are causing us problems. So does God want us healed? Definitely he wants us healed. It is revealed will. Why are we not healed? The one, ignorance. Two, timing. There's a timing for it. Three, obedience. Four, bad life life choices and lifestyle you know if you keep eating chocolate you can't bind the spirit of fat if you keep eating unhealthy foods you cannot bind every demonic calorie in the food I, 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 you can't as jenna was telling us yesterday that that we told her that he loves his body too much to eat indomie noodles <laughs> she was repenting of Indomie. <laughs> I believe you can eat Indomie once in a while, but when Indomie becomes, like some people that they, they feast on McDonald's all the time, you see what it does to their body. It's not, you know, yeah, the odd treats once a week, you know, you give the children, that's fine. But when it becomes the what they eat on a daily basis, then you are destroying the temple of the Holy Spirit. So there's all that, there's that, there's that. Then there is go for regular checkups many people you know when was the last time you went for a checkup your wife has been telling you go 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 you say ah, it's okay i'm all right then when something has now gone wrong and it has now gone beyond k leg then we all now start praying crazy prayers when you could have uh, avoided it simply by going for the test at the time they told you to go for the test am i preaching or am i or am i um, or am i annoying <laughs> So, again, there are lifestyle choices. Then there are issues of faith. There are where God permits certain things to come upon you to try your faith, to try your patience, to try to work a, a more excellent way of glory in your life. So there are many, many reasons, but the categorical thing is that uh, uh, is that you, you, God wants you healed. God wants you healed. He wants you. It is his desire that you be healed. There's no point. The law of double jeopardy, the law of double jeopardy says that no, no crime can be paid for twice. Once a crime has been paid for, it cannot be paid for again. That's justice. That's justice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, this faith thing is tough, but that's it. So, 
if Jesus, if the Bible says by his stripes you are healed, it means Jesus paid the price. He took it upon himself. Surely he bore it. He carried it. Now, why do I want to carry it? Why again am I carrying what has already been carried? Say, but pastor, I've been praying and nothing's happening. Keep praying. Me, I don't stop until I see what I, 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 I don't stop until I see what I am to trust in God for. I will not give up. I will not die until I see God's plan for my life come to pass. So, um, and if my prayer is not enough, I will invite Tunjak. I will invite Pastor, brother, uh, Pastor Victor. I will invite somebody. Let us pray it together. If our prayer is not enough, I invite the church. If the church is not enough, I invite crusade. Whatever I will, <laughs> I will do whatever I have to do because I am not going to die sick. That is the, because that's the promise of God for my life. Say, so, but Pastor, a well-known evangelist, Pastor Bishop died. No, 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 no. Please, I'm not. I'm not criticizing them, and I'm not. I'm, every man has to be fully persuaded. You have to fight your own fight of faith. I can't fight yours for you. You can't fight mine for me. We have to fight it. Even identical twins can't fight it for themselves, for each other. They have, you have to fight your own yourself. So you have to know what you say, know what you believe, know whom you have believed, know what has been said to you. Go. And then this is also the importance of meetings like this, where we keep stocking up your faith. We keep encouraging your faith. We keep bombarding you with the word until the thing finds root in your heart. That is, this is what it's about. So I, I hope, uh, Brother Osas, I hope that answers your, your question. I hope that answers that, that question. So after all of that, if the person still dies, Koriko <laughs> Kikarika. Pastor, it's it's funny that uh, Sister Gerald wrote that. I'm yeah. actually experiencing that as we speak. Yeah. Um, one of um, our members in church, we we prayed for him, and he passed on yesterday evening. Oh, so, mm. yes. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, I will still keep praying. I will still keep believing. I will still keep holding on. I will still, there are some things I don't understand, but that does not negate my faith. I will still keep believing for myself. I will still keep saying, if I am sick, I will still keep saying, I will not die, but I will live to declare the salvation of the Lord. I will still speak for myself and I will still call the brethren. Some of you too, you are too proud to call people to pray with you. Too proud. It's okay. I don't want to trouble anybody. Ah, trouble us. Ooh. It's not way because you see, if you don't trouble us now, you will not trouble us later. And when you die, there's more trouble. You give us more trouble because we have to now start finding money to bury you and all those kind of things, you know, and how to look after the people you have left behind. So that's more troubles. Trouble us now that we can seek the Lord while he may yet be found. Trouble us. This is the time to trouble us. Don't say, I don't want to trouble you. Trouble, because if you don't trouble us, you will, it will, you will still trouble us later. So when you, and when you are gone, sometimes the trouble you leave is bigger than the trouble that you gave when you were alive. So don't say, I don't want to trouble you. Sometimes that's pride too. I just want to do my own business. I don't want anybody to know my business. Cry out. Help! <laughs> People of God, help! Then all of us will pray. The effectual prayer, favorite prayer of a righteous man will avail much. Pastor, I think one thing I've, I've, I've um, been able to like um, gain from this morning's session is um, the issue of timing. As yeah. in, at a point in time, you can still recover. As in, you can still help yourself. You can pray. Or you can call mm -hmm. them to come and pray so that you can recover sufficiently for you to go and start praying and yeah. get yourself out of that situation. But if the person has succumbed to this thing for so much that they're no longer with it, it's, yeah. it's no longer possible for them to pray. They're not in their, you know, yeah. um, their faculties to think. Um, mm. Yeah, I guess that's one thing that we, we don't want to, where we don't want to be. Yeah, exactly. 
and the beautiful thing is about it is that even then, the birth, birthdays are still avails, the house of mercy still avails. Because there are times when you can't help yourself, and God will raise people to help you. Like those from that man whose four brothers carried him because he couldn't carry himself. So we thank God. But you are right that sometimes we leave things to fester until it gets too late. And then by that point, we don't even have, we don't have enough faith to even carry anything, you know, and we don't even have enough faith to even ask other people to exercise faith on our behalf. We don't even, there are times when we give them. And another answer to this question that is asked, I remember us praying for somebody who died. And when I was asking God, one of the things that God said to me was, some people you are praying for to live don't want to live. They don't want to live. I told you guys this story of one of my daughters. We were praying for her. We were praying for her. And she was, she, she was having all kinds of complications, operations, pain, all sorts of things. And then I told you guys that one day, Momio, God just laid it on our hearts. It, just, it was almost at the same time, both of us just knew. Momio said, we need to go and see this girl now. And my spirit just bore witness. So we just dressed up. We went straight to her house. We got there. She was in a bad state. So we just prayed for her. We said, and as we we're praying, the spirit of God said, we should rebuke the spirit of death. So I said, you will not die. You will live to declare the salvation of Lord. We rebuke the spirit of death. We, we strengthen you with might by God's spirit in the inner man and everything. She went to the hospital the next day as she had been going and nobody knew what to do. She went to the hospital the next day. They were able to diagnose what the problem was and then they were able to start treating her. And then the situation just turned around like that dramatically. But do you know what happened? She told us, she said then that night, that night, the night before, that she had decided she had had enough. She had decided she was giving up. She said, look, it's okay. If I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm not going to go to hell anyway. So this thing is too much. So she decided. So when we came to pray for her, we encouraged her, her faith. And then she, she decided that she would leave again. And then she went to the hospital and then they discovered it. So if we hadn't gone to pray for her, guess what would have happened? She would have died. And then all of us would have been saying, oh, but we prayed for her. But she had, she had decided she didn't want to leave. She had decided, I've had enough. Let me go home. And God will not work against your will. He won't work against, he's giving you a free will. He will say, okay, come home. Since you, you, you remember Elijah? Remember Elijah? Elijah said, it's okay, it's enough. I've done all the miracles, it's enough. I, I, I don't want to leave anymore. It's okay, take me home. I'm no better than my father's. So God said, okay, all right. Before you go, anoint Elisha in your stead. Uh, anoint Jehu as king of this. Anoint uh, as Israel as king of this. And then and then God took him home, really, because at that point, he, had, he, he, he said, I've had enough. So Elisha now, if Elisha didn't know the prayer that Elijah prayed, would now be saying, God, why did you take my master from me? Why, after all the prayers we prayed, the, pray, the saints prayed, everybody prayed, the church prayed, everybody, why? And still he, 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 he went up. The man didn't want to stay. Am I making sense? Yeah. All right. So, so that's, that's sometimes that. Okay, Tunji, what was the second question? Sorry about that. I, I hope that, I hope that has uh, put some, cast some light on it. Okay, so. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, Antonia, please correct me if I'm uh, jumping, if I represent, misrepresent the question. Um, I think we're talking about, I think, Pastor, I, I think maybe you have an answered this already, but I think um, maybe there's a different dimension that Antonia is asking this. She's saying that, um, does God sometimes deal with you in terms of when you're talking about healing earlier and you're talking about maturity and all that? So does God sometimes deal with us or heal us based on the level of our maturity? In other words, uh, let, this is my example. Um, so maybe when I was I'm a baby Christian, right? I, um, um, as we have been talking, my, 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 my faith is anchored on the fact that if I touch the hem of his garment, or if I can get his handkerchief laid on me, or yeah. if the shadow can fall, you know, my faith is like 
like you said earlier, point of contact. So as a baby yeah. Christian, my, my faith is anchored to those things. And God deals with us based on our level. He, he then heals yeah. me, right? But then yeah. I'm mature. I start to go on, get on in, in life. Uh, in, well, when I say in life, in the Christian faith, I'm yeah. maturing. Um, would then, would, I mean, but I still keep anchoring my faith now. So what was initially, what was my, initially, what the, the point of conduct was like, you know, it was, God was using whatever faith I had in that point to then engage me and heal me. But now I know better. I know his word. I know it's in the finished work. I know it's Christ. I know to look to Christ. But if I was still then looking at, if I still have to go to, again, using the example, not because there's anything wrong with this man of God, but just because we use them exact, um, as an example. If I still have to go to Oyedeko to pray over the oil for me to anoint, or, you know, still expecting some shadow, I go and stand on the feet, waiting for pastor to drive outside, shadow can hit me, or I, I, I'd say, you look, look, somebody please go and get handkerchief from Brother Olu and come and lay Would How does that work? Is, yeah, you, you are right. You are, or, or not? You are right. Yeah. You, are, you are very correct. You mm. see, I have two grandchildren. One of them is about 14, 15 months old. The other is six years old. They, I, I don't deal with them on the same level. You know, um, the the fifteen month old one, when she wants to eat, she just goes more, more, you know, and she points to the food, nana, you know, and if she doesn't get it on time, she cries, you know, and I respond to that. Now, if the six year old is, is is telling me more, more, and nana, my friend, go and uh, you know, use your words. What do you want? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So you you are right that. The, there's, there's the, the way that you that God deals with us, when you are a baby, everything you want, you get. And all you need to do to get attention is to cry. That's all, to, uh, to shout or throw a tantrum and you get it. But that's why Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child. But now God is calling me to put away childish things. So yes, you are right. So as a child, I may need, I may have needed an handkerchief to anchor my feet. I may need to drink some something. Let somebody pray over the water and I drink it so that I have a point. But now he's saying, come on, come on. Mm-hmm. By his stripes. Do, 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 what? By now, you don't, as in, isn't there the connection in your spirit that mm-hmm. it is done? It's a finished work mm-hmm. that you just you just believe and receive. Do, do, do you get what I'm saying? So you, there is, no, there's no question about it. You remember when you first gave your life to Christ, you are going to the bus stop, you just pray, say, Father, as I get to that bus stop, I want the bus to come. Yeah. The bus will actually be even waiting for you. You, you know how it is. You know, you we're so excited. Like, like, wow, this Christianity thing works, man. <laughs> <laughs> and you were so excited and everything. And it happened like that. And then after a while, it started, God started to, drawback. He started to purge you. Mm. He started to remove those things. It didn't work like that anymore. Um, why? Because there's now the working of your faith through your, your through faith and patience. Mm. There, there are other things that are at work now. Yes. God is beginning to show you your old man does not live by bread alone, alone but yes. by every word. God is now saying you are too mature for this. You are going to have to suffer certain things. You have to now wait for certain things. You have to be deprived of certain things. You have to deprive yourself of certain Mm. things. You have to fast. You know, I have this wonderful man of God that I respect and love, you know, anointed when he preaches, elucidates the word. He doesn't believe in fasting. I was trying to tell me some crazy doctrine about uh, uh, Jesus said when the, the, uh, when is uh, when I was with you, with you, you don't need to fast. But when the man, <laughs> anointed man of God, very very balanced and graced in many other areas, I said. <laughs> so I said, I said, so what about Paul? What about Paul? After well, after Jesus did had come and, and he was still fasting and all that and. I, so I just I say, if you don't want to fast, it's okay. Don't fast. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Don't fast. Me, I'm going to keep fasting. It's okay. That we let's agree to this. Let's not fight about something mm. like that. Just it's okay because your doctrine is sound in other areas, and I learn a lot from him in other things. A lot. Mm-hmm. So uh, um, you know, but uh, I, I, you know, fasting 
there's a place for fasting. It helps you to keep your body under. It helps you to, you know, there are just certain things that you, you need, to, you know. And I know that in the New Testament, after fasting, they, there was a lot of fasting. After Jesus had gone to heaven and everything, there was a lot of fasting. So to tell me that it's in the Old Testament, was, I mean, like it's, it's almost like Old Testament. Ah, I said, ah, 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 don't, don't go there. Don't go there. Just, if you don't want to fast, don't fast. But don't, don't even go there. So what I'm saying is, as you mature, there are certain things that you have to drop. There are certain things you have to endure. You have to suffer for Christ's sake. You have to swear to your own hurt sometimes. And change. Not you have to lose certain things uh, so that you can gain certain things um, and all that. So yeah, uh, definitely there, 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 there are dimensions. And then, you know, that sometimes where, do you remember Paul saying um, one of his associates was sick almost unto death? This is Paul, whose handkerchief is healing people, whose shadow is healing. How come you can't heal the person that is your your one of your helpers? You can't mm. have his physician healed that said mm. you couldn't heal him. Mm. And he mm. said, in fact, he was sick almost to death, but God had mercy mm. on me mm. so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. <laughs> you mm. can so you can imagine. This guy would have died, and Paul, there was nothing, you know, Paul could do about it. So, and, it because, uh, and, and it wasn't because he didn't have faith. It wasn't because he didn't have faith yeah. at all. Because after that, in that same chapter, we see him take, doing some very crazy miracles, you know, that same chapter, but he couldn't heal his own person because that's not what Jesus was doing at that point. So, you, you know, we, 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 we are maturing in him, we're growing, and he's teaching us all sorts of I, I hope that that answers Antonia's question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said yes. <laughs> Just about right. to yeah. Miss Nia, you have to you have to reward your husband for taking on this question for you and standing in the gap on your behalf. You know, you have to reward him. I I, I you can't just be using him anyhow like this. So I I, I decree you that. Pastor, this is your daughter. Did you hear what you said? She said she said it's... connection has caught. <laughs> <laughs> I'm breaking up. Pastor is breaking up. Eh? <laughs> it's a lie. You heard it before the connection cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions thank, before thank we you. before we close? Anything else on the chat that we've not answered? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> said, Pastor, stop <laughs> encouraging this bad behavior of romance <laughs> online. <laughs> no, uh, Sister know, Jerome, what we're know, trying uh, to do is we're encouraging people so that you people will know that this is it, there is a sweetness to this part too. Because every time that you hear, it's always uh, this one is currently with this, uh, this one is divorcing this. This so what we are trying to show you is that there are people who are enjoying themselves, who are who the thing is sweet. Eh? Brother Olu and Sister Biso are doing Canadian romance, and they are also planning the girl, you know. So all sorts of things are going on. <laughs> Pastor, they've already agreed for the adoption. We arranged. Uh, no, the, no, no. The fact that you are adopted does not mean you can still have it. Uh, we uh, arranged for the dedication, adult dedication. <laughs> oh my God, adult dedication. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Dakwa, I had back to you. So we'll conclude this. What we've done is we've laid a very solid foundation. So now we'll come to the actuality of what Jesus, when he, because it was, is this issue of wholeness. So we'll come to it um, next month. <laughs> Our last one for the year. The 11th or 12th. 11th, yes, it will be 11th. This is the year. Okay. All right. So okay. you don't want to miss next week's and you want to bring everybody so that because it's, going, it's really going to be exciting. It's really going to be. We're going to see some stuff that we have not, we've not considered, you know, in a way we may not have considered it before. Okay. Awesome.